All right, First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. Please give your attention as I read God's holy word. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to Praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into." Thus far, the reading of God's Word. Well, I think it was now 10 years ago that my wife and I were in Europe together. Uh, yeah, I know, she's giving me a look. 10 years, yeah, 10 years. 10 years ago, we, we um, made a trip to Europe for a vacation, and one of the places we stopped was a little town in the north of Belgium called Ghent, spelled G-H-E-N-T. And we had a wonderful time there, uh, met some very interesting people there in Ghent, uh, very friendly people. I mean, the, 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 the Belgians are very friendly, uh, unlike the French, but I won't get into that. Um, but they were very friendly people. But there was this one interesting structure in the middle of town, was this tall cathedral. It was a tall church. It's, it, it, it's uh, St. Bavo's Cathedral in, in Ghent. And the interesting thing about it was it, it, it had to be about three or four stories tall. But they had markers along the wall with years that indicated how far the progress got at a certain year. And it, it took like nearly eight or nine hundred years to start from a very small structure to the, stall, the tall structure you have there today. So it was these, these time markers that showed the building progression at various stages in their history until finally they had the full cathedral built and the people could enjoy uh, worshiping in this wonderful building. Well, why do I tell you about this random cathedral in a random town in Europe? Because what Peter is talking about here in this passage is the idea of the progressive revelation of Scripture. Scripture did not come to us in the Bible bound to us as a whole and just drop out of heaven like this. It was revealed progressively over stages of time. Uh, you know, words here, words there, and eventually they were collected and preserved into what we have with us this morning. And one of the things we see here, or that we're going to see here, is that as Peter is talking about our living hope, that uh, the hope to which we were born again, the hope that is guaranteed by the resurrection of Christ from the dead, the hope which is our inheritance that is being kept for us and we are being reserved for it, the hope that sustains us through the various trials that we face, is the hope that, was, that we are destined to. It is a hope to which we are destined. And it is shown here as the prophets of old testified to it. The prophets of old prophesied about it. And then the apostles verified this this hope. It was revealed to them and they didn't realize what they were seeing, what they were what they were prophesying to until now in the New Testament we see that Peter is saying they were prophesying 
to you, my dear sojourners and exiles who are suffering under various trials today. The Old Testament prophets were talking about the glories and, and sufferings of Christ, and they were prophesying that to you. So that uh, what we see here is that Peter's readers, and then us by extension, are destined for this living hope. It was something that was prophesied in the Old Testament, testified to the prophets of old by the Holy Spirit, and then verified by the apostles uh, in the New Testament. And that's our theme this morning. Our living hope was prophesied in the Old Testament, testified by the Holy Spirit, verified by the apostles, and those will be our points as well. Hope prophesied, verse 10. Hope testified, verse 11. And hope verified, verse 12. So first in verse 10, we see hope prophesied, hope prophesied of this salvation. The prophets have inquired and searched carefully those prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Now when Peter says of this salvation, remember verses 3 through 12, one long sentence. Right, So uh, even though we've been breaking it down a little bit, it's one long sentence. So when he says of this salvation, he's talking about what you see at the end of verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith or the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is the salvation he talks about in, in verse 10. So he continues, this is of this salvation, the one that is the, the fulfillment of your faith, the one that sustains you through the various trials, the one that to which you have been born again, this living hope of this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of this grace, they searched and inquired about it. So Peter now pivots to speak concerning this salvation. And, he's, and in the, what he's saying about the salvation is that it was foretold. The salvation to which I'm telling you here, this living hope of which I am trying to encourage you with, as sojourners and exiles, is something that was foretold. It was something that was prophesied by the Old Testaments of old. In fact, you have here the prophets, as they are prophesying, are inquiring. They are searching carefully as they prophesy about this grace that would come. Now we'll look more about their searching uh, in verse 11. But here he's saying that this grace that would come to you and he's speaking about his readers so what peter is saying here is that these prophets of old who were prophesying in the context of the old testament during their times whether it doesn't matter whether it was it was elijah or isaiah or hosea or daniel all these guys who were prophesying in their specific context in redemptive history were prophesying of this salvation the grace that would come to peter's readers to us to all, New to, to all New Testament believers. The living hope that sustains Peter's readers who are described as pilgrims, as elect pilgrims, as strangers in this world who are going through various trials because they are living out their Christian faith in a world that hates them, in a world in which they are not citizens of. These various trials... Uh, that we will face is a grace that was foretold in the Old Testament. If you would please turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And I want to look at verses 21 through 24 in Luke chapter 10. This is something that, there's a parallel in Matthew chapter 11, but in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 21, uh, we see here that in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, so Jesus is praying, and he's praying publicly. He's praying in front of people at this point. He says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. 
And no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Then He turned to His disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. So what Jesus is saying here is in a sense what Peter is saying because Jesus in a sense said it to Peter in verse 23. He turns to his disciples, Peter of whom was one of his disciples. And he says, look, your eyes, Peter and Matthew and John and and all the others, your eyes are blessed. Why? Because you are seeing the things to which the prophets have foretold, the things that they desired to see, the things that they prophesied and wondered. It's like, what in the world is this that I am speaking to these people? What is this grace of which I am prophesying to? And Jesus says, they were talking about, of course, him, because you are now seeing the fulfillment of these prophecies in bodily form in Jesus Christ. Your eyes are blessed because you are seeing the things that prophets and kings desire to look into and which was foretold by the prophets of old. I've looked at this passage a number of times in this context as well uh, in the book of Hebrews. Chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews, verses 13 and following. Where there in the book of Hebrews, the writer talking about these saints of old, he's talking about the patriarchs in this case, though, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them for afar, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. But the point I want to make is in verse 13, where he says, the patriarchs all died in faith. God made promises to the patriarchs about land and descendants and all these things. Yet they died with no land and no descendants or very few descendants. Certainly not as numerous as the uh, the stars of of the sky or the sand of the sea. They received the promises or they've received the promises from afar but not the fulfillment of them. Again, the promises made to these fathers of old just as the prophecies that were given to the prophets of old is something that is about the grace that was revealed now to Peter's readers. Paul likes to talk about this in his letters when he talks about the mystery, right? The mystery. A mystery was something that was hidden and concealed in the Old Testament, but revealed in the New. And Paul has many mysteries. He talks about the mystery of the uh, glorious transformation of our bodies in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, or the mystery of Gentile inclusion into the people of God in Ephesians chapter 3. That's what Peter is talking about here. Our living hope, was, is the mystery that Paul talks about that is revealed, uh, hidden in the old, revealed in the new. The, uh, in our living hope here, is, as Peter is saying, is prophesied in the Old Testament that we are now seeing the fruits of that. Now, the grace that would come to you, dear readers, dear elect pilgrims, sojourners and exiles in this world. One commentator uh, great commentary a woman named Karen Jobes wrote this the Christians to whom Peter writes are not to understand themselves as practitioners of yet another new religion in the world founded on the person of Jesus of Nazareth rather they are being privileged with the knowledge of the gospel that fulfills God's mysterious plan as revealed to the prophets of old and that brings them into community with what God has already been doing through ancient Israel. So Peter here is connecting what was revealed to ancient Israel through the prophets, and he's connecting us to that story. He's connecting us to that story as we are the recipients, uh, the people destined for this living hope that was prophesied in old. I mean, often imagine... 
You know, imagine if you were, imagine Isaiah, right? He's, he's writing his prophecy down. He gets to Isaiah 53 and he starts writing about the suffering servant. Can you imagine I, Isaiah wonders like, who is this one? Who is this one who's going to take our iniquities upon his shoulders? Who's going to die for our sins? Who's going to be crushed and bruised for our our iniquities? Who is this one? Or Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 where he's he's seeing the the image of the 70 weeks and he's wondering who is this one who will will make a covenant? Or Hosea when he prophesies in Hosea 11 about out of Egypt I called my son. Who is this one? Or any of the Old Testament prophets prophesying and speaking of these things in shadow. These things that they longed, they desired to understand. They inquired and searched carefully. Yet Peter saw the fulfillment of this in Jesus. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The one who is the fulfillment of all these prophecies. He saw Jesus. And now us And Peter's readers live on the other side of this. Now we're looking at this as something that has occurred, something that has been fulfilled in Christ. So that is hope prophesied. Now we see hope testified in verse 11. Peter here continues in verse 11 to speak of the prophets searching for the timing or the circumstances, if you will, behind the context of their oracles. So here are these prophets of old searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. In other words, as another commentator writes, the data, or data, depending on how you say that word, the data the prophets lacked in particular were time and context which were needed to give full understanding of their words for communication has meaning only in context. Again, think of the prophets like Isaiah and Daniel, those prophecies that particularly point to Christ specifically and and not having seen Christ, not knowing who the Messiah is yet, so they're wondering who is this? So they search. They search diligently Searching, what is this? Or who is this? Or what are the circumstances behind this? Because we realize here the prophets, though inspired, were not omniscient. They, they, did, they did not, they, I mean, they were men like you and me, right? They were men like you and me, inspired to be sure, inspired by the Spirit of God. Yet they were not in privy to all of God's plans. They were not privy to God's eternal decree. Which is why here we see that they're searching, trying to seek diligently and inquire what it, what it is they were, they were speaking of. We've spoken on several occasions about, as I said earlier, the progressive nature of special revelation. The Old Testament, and as it was progressively revealed through the Torah and then through the history and then through the prophets, um, you know, the, the way the Torah is, or the way the Old Testament is broken down is the law, the prophets, and the writings. While sufficient for the faith of the Old Testament saint, is still waiting its fulfillment in the New Testament. That's why Paul in Galatians 4 will say, in the fullness of time. In the, when, when time is ripe, when, when everything was ready to be revealed, God sent forth His Son. The fulfillment of all the prophecies, all the shadows, all the types of the Old Testament come now in His Son, born under the law, born of a woman, to redeem those who are born under the law. So think of the progressive nature of revelation as a seed that begins small and grows into a plant or as one of my professors in seminary said think of a, a of a house that you kind of continue to add to the structure you know the house at each point in its expansion is still uh, livable it still serves its purpose yet there's more to come or again think of that Cathedral in Ghent, St. Bavos, you know, each time they added to it, it was still uh, serving a function, but it wasn't yet complete. That's the idea here of this progressive nature of special revelation. It is revealed in pieces, yet each time there's a, a piece that is revealed, it is enough for those Old Testament saints to believe and trust and have faith in God and His promises. Now it's interesting here that Peter uses this turn of phrase in verse 11, the Spirit of Christ. We don't 
see that terribly often. Uh, we, we hear the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Holiness. Um, Paul, in Romans 8, verse 9, refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Christ. It's, it's the Holy Spirit, right? We're not talking about the Holy Spirit of God and that the Spirit of Christ are like two different spirits here. It's the Spirit of Christ. But Peter is using this name for the Spirit because it indicates the Christocentric nature of Scripture or the, the Christ-centeredness nature of Scripture. It's the Spirit of Christ attesting to the prophets who are then prophesying about Christ. As we see at the end of verse 11, they testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So it was, in a sense, the Spirit of Christ bringing this inspiration to these uh, Old Testament prophets so that they could prophesy about the Christ who was to come. So these Holy Spirit-inspired Old Testament prophets testified beforehand. They spoke beforehand. They witnessed, literally, to witness ahead of time to speak of Christ's sufferings and glories. Note the order there too. Remember, we talk about this as well, that Christ came to suffer and then be exalted to glory. Christ came to go and die on the cross and then be exalted to God's right hand. Suffering unto glory. Suffering unto glory. This is again something Jesus says to his disciples at the end of Luke's Gospel um, on the road to Emmaus. If you, you know that story well. Uh, after the resurrection you've got a couple of disciples that are on the road to Emmaus we don't know who they are they're unnamed but Jesus appears to them but they don't recognize who he is and, they be, and Jesus begins asking them questions like you know what's been going on you know what's the news today and the disciples are like are you the only person here in Jerusalem has not heard what happened about how this Jesus of Nazareth whom we thought was the Messiah uh, was put to death and he continues to humor them for a while. And then in verse 25 of Luke 24, Jesus says to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. The Holy Spirit inspired, the Spirit of Christ inspired these prophets to prophesy beforehand the sufferings and glories of Christ, as Peter says. Verse 26, Ought not the Christ who have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Again, there Jesus is confirming that order as well. Suffering, then glory. And then he says here, verse 27, the, the one that we all quote, right? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The things concerning himself. Holy Scripture, beloved, speaks with one voice. Old Testament, New Testament. It speaks with one voice. It is a story of redemption from the table of contents all the way to the concordance and the maps at the end of your Bible. It is one story of redemption that has Christ at its centerpiece. That Christ is the hinge upon which this story turns. Again, the Spirit of Christ inspiring these prophets of old to testify beforehand the grace, or sorry, the sufferings and glories of Christ that would follow. So the Old Testament then is Christian Scripture. We need to read the Old Testament from a Christian perspective, from a Christian view. It is our history as much as it is the history of the people of God of old. Which is why Paul can say in 2 Timothy to his protege Timothy that the scriptures are profitable. They are profitable for the man of God. He's at the, now he's speaking, of course, of all scripture, but at the time that, that Paul wrote that, he is speaking specifically of the Old Testament because that's all they had at the time. It's like the scriptures are profitable, Timothy, to make you, the man of God, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Those same Old Testament scriptures are profitable for us as well so that we could be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing because they foretell, they foretell, they prophesy, they witness beforehand about the glories, the sufferings and glories of Christ. So finally, let's look at hope verified in verse 12. 
the living hope prophesied by the Old Testament prophets, testified to them by the Holy Spirit, we see here now is verified by the New Testament apostles. To them, the Old Testament prophets, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. So Peter begins verse 12 by acknowledging that even though the Old Testament prophets searched diligently, that they inquired, uh, inquiring minds want to know, right? They inquired, they searched carefully, they searched trying to find out the timing and the context of what the Spirit of Christ was testifying to them. Peter here is acknowledging that what was being revealed to them, the grace that was revealed to them, they were not prophesying to their own time. It's like they were testifying not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering to us the things which have now been reported. In other words, the... Old Testament needs the New Testament. If we were just to stop at Malachi, that'd be like stopping the Lord of the Rings at the end of the two towers and just not continuing to hear the end of that story, right? Or watching, you know, any, you know, reading any story that's in multiple parts. You need the New Testament. The New Testament completes the Old Testament. And here we see the apostles who were inspired by the very same spirit that inspired the Old Testament prophets verify they verify what the old testament prophets prophesied so what they prophesied right to them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you in other words we the new testament apostles are reporting to you the same things that they reported in their day we have preached the gospel to you, the gospel that is the centerpiece there by the Holy Spirit, same Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The prophets foretold the salvation. Jesus accomplished it, and the Spirit led Peter and the apostles to describe it. And that is the pattern that you see in the scriptures, if you will. You've got the prediction of salvation. You've got the fulfillment of salvation. And then you've got the interpretation of the saving events. So the Old Testament predicts salvation. The Gospels and the book of Acts kind of uh, show the fulfillment of salvation. And then the New Testament epistles explain the meaning and interpret what the salvation and these saving events accomplish. And we have multiple examples, if you will, of... New Testament interpretation of the Old Testament that wouldn't necessarily be obvious to an Old Testament person reading it. Ladies, we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew, and if you remember back in Matthew 2, Matthew says when Jesus and his family went to Egypt and then they were drawn out of Egypt, Matthew then quotes Hosea 11 verse 1 and says, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now you read Hosea in its context, and if you were to say, I'm just going to stick to what Hosea is saying, there is no way on earth that you would just reading Hosea without the New Testament would understand that Hosea was prophesying about Christ. Doesn't mean that what Hosea was saying at the time didn't have any use for that time, but there was another meaning attached to that that Matthew draws out when he writes his gospel. That Jesus, in a sense, was recapitulating or walking in the footsteps of Israel just as Israel was in Egypt. Uh, Jesus went to Egypt just as Israel was brought out of Egypt. Jesus was brought out of Egypt. Or think of Peter's sermon in Acts verse, or chapter 2 when Peter gives that great Pentecost Day sermon and he begins to interpret Old Testament scriptures. He preaches from Joel chapter 2. He preaches from Psalm 16. He preaches from Psalm 110. And he talks about how all of these things are being fulfilled and have been fulfilled in Christ right then and there on this day of Joel chapter 2. He says, today this prophecy is being fulfilled in your midst. He talks about Psalm 16, how he's saying it wasn't David's body that, that didn't see corruption in the grave. And he talks about Psalm 110, about the, the, the one who was to come, come and sit. My Lord, says to, uh, to, uh, my Lord says to his Lord, come and sit at his right hand. Peter is expounding the Old Testament prophets and Psalms 
from a New Testament perspective. In other words, from a perspective of fulfillment. So what Peter is telling his readers, his elect exiles, his elect pilgrims of the dispersion, that they were destined for this living hope. This hope that was prophesied in old, uh, testified by the Holy Spirit, and now verified by us. You were destined for this. You were destined to hear and receive this living hope, this hope that is undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, that is founded upon the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. One that is being kept in heaven for you and you by the power of God are being kept for it. This was destined. You were destined for this hope. The Old Testament prophets, in a sense, were speaking to Peter's readers. The Old Testament prophets are now speaking to us as well. And what helps sojourners and exiles now as we are facing our various trials is knowing that we were destined for this living hope. As this unfolded, as Peter says here at the end of verse 12, he says, things which angels desire to look into. What a great passage there. What a great passage. As, as this unfolding mystery is, is being revealed slowly through the Old Testament, finds its fulfillment in Christ, and now Peter is expounding this to his readers. The angels up in heaven are looking down and just like, wow, this is amazing. This, look at this happening here. Right, you know, Jesus, when he tells the parables in Luke 15, says there is more joy in heaven when one sinner repents than when 99 don't. And the angels in heaven are throwing a party when one sinner repents. The angels here in heaven are, are looking down and they desire to look into this living hope as it is being unfolded in the lives of Peter's readers. They are in awe as they see God's power working through this this insignificant word called the gospel as the spirit now works in these insignificant people to bring them to salvation well beloved just like saint bavo's cathedral in ghent redemptive history is a progressive unfolding mystery that sees its fulfillments in the sufferings and the glories of christ as i said last time it's very easy to take our eyes off the prize when we are going through our various trials. And the encouragement that Peter here is bringing to us is that just as the Old Testament prophets prophesied of the sufferings and glories of Messiah, so too we will go through sufferings until we reach glory. The, the path that Jesus took is the path we are taking. That's why, Jesus, or that's why Peter here says, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Or as he says later on, do not be surprised when the fiery trials come upon you. But we are suffering for glory. We are suffering unto glory. The glory that will be revealed at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are, the genuineness of our faith is being tested so it may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus in Matthew 5, at the end of the Beatitudes, says, Blessed are you who are persecuted for my name's sake, for your reward in heaven will be great. Or as Jesus says to his disciples in the upper room, and at the end of John 16, he says, In this world you have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. The glories, the sufferings and glories of Christ are ours as well. We will go through suffering unto glory. And let's not miss here the awesome privilege that Peter's readers and us as well have living in the days of fulfillment. We are living in the days of fulfillment. Days the prophets tried to understand and the angels desire to look into. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 talks about how these things were written for us as an example for us. So beloved, we are sojourners and exiles in this world. We have been destined here to a living hope that we see that Peter talks about in the first few verses. The living hope that was prophesied in the Old Testament. The living hope that was testified by the Holy Spirit. The living hope that is verified by the apostles. It is a living hope that has its foundation. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is a living hope that is, as he says, incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade. It is a living hope that is reserved in heaven for us. 
It is a living hope by which we too, through the power of God, by faith, are being reserved for it. So, beloved, as we go through our various trials, understand this living hope to which we've been destined is a living hope that we will receive when Jesus Christ returns in glory at the end of the age. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a glorious truth, the truth that we have been destined to this living hope. I pray, Lord, for any here who are going through the various trials that Peter speaks of, I pray, Lord, that you will sustain them and encourage them with these words. We know the trials are not easy. We know that suffering is never easy. But, Lord, we know that your word promises an eternal weight of glory. It promises that we have an incorruptible, undefiled, unfading inheritance kept in heaven for us. So may we not only be encouraged through this, but also assured That this hope that has been spoken of is one that we have been destined for. Is the Old Testament has prophesied about this to us. What they were talking about is seeing its fulfillment now in us. So Lord, help us, guide us, protect us, sustain us until you return. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.